الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين وصلوات الله وسلامه على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد فقد قال الله في محكم كتابه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا واذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ كنتم أعداء فألف بين قلوبكم فأصبحتم بنعمته إخوانا وكنتم على شفا حفرة من النار فأنقذكم منها كذلك يبين الله لكم آياته لعلكم تهتدون صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Can everyone at the back hear me okay? I don't know if my voice is traveling. Good, alhamdulillah. Wa shukur. Alhamdulillah for another Muharram. And I say alhamdulillah because, and it's another opportunity to remember our beloved Imam Hussein, his companions, um, his family, who died in order to preserve our religion. It's an opportunity for us to shed tears. And inshallah, through every tear that we shed is... Uh, a hope for a spark for change within us. We don't want to leave this month having only worn black, met people, eaten a lot of timanuqima. We want to have left this month uh, feeling that maybe there is um, some hope for a little bit of a, a change within us and within the society around us and our community. And that's really the main theme of... Um, that's really the main theme of my talk today, is um, the fact that we, as a human species, were always designed and hardwired to be connected to each other. It's prevalent throughout the Quran as a theme, a theme of togetherness. So from the very moment we are gathered, even before we are born, in Alam al-Dhar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us collectively, Alastu bi rabbikum, He talks to us all and says, Am I not your Lord? And we say, Bella. And from that moment on, we are intrinsically connected. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayuhan nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'annakum shu'uban wa qaba'il. From the moment we come onto this earth, we are born nations and tribes. He doesn't say, wa ja'annakum fi shu'uban wa qaba'il, like you're an individual that just happens to be part of a tribe. You're actually born as a collective, as something far greater than yourself. And then even beyond al qiyamah even in Jannah, when we are in close proximity to our Lord and we have everything we desire, even at that moment we need other people. Because there are so many ayat that says, متكئين عليها متقابلين على سرر متقابلين. So we are sitting opposite each other and conversing in, even in Jannah. We need each other even at that time when we have Allah, and we have our biggest, you know, we have everything fulfilled, we still need the connection of other human beings. It's a fundamental part of who we are. And for all of our uh, history as humankind, we have been this way. So from the time when we were cave people, hunter-gatherers, when we went out to get food, we went out in groups. And those that were isolated, maybe, or had less people in their tribe, they were less likely to survive. You know, we always look at Darwin's theory um, and quote things like survival of the fittest. This is not actually his phrase. Even if you believe in um, evolution as a concept, Darwin later came to realize that it was collaboration that most likely kept people alive, not every man for himself. It was those who collaborated, were kind and sympathetic and empathetic with each other that were more likely to then have offspring and survive. So whichever way you look at it, um, we are always meant to be together. And in a way, it's only been in the last maybe 50 years um, that this has even changed in, even in this country. Um, if you talk to older people who may be living on your road, um, older sort of Anglo-Saxon white people, or people that have been here for a long time, they'll tell you how they used to know all their neighbors, how everyone used to say hello to each other. And it's really very, very fast, 
evolution of, of this sort of fragmentation and individualism that's come about. And we don't realize it because it's come on so, it's crept up on us. And as a community, we've always maybe thought of ourselves as a bit protected because we have things in common, we have our faith, we have maybe our ethnic background, but we are all becoming that way. We are all becoming much more fragmented, much more um, into our individual lives. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. And as a result, we are experiencing the very many um, consequences of that that the wider community are experiencing at large. So, in terms of what are the benefits of, 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 of being together and what's the harm of this disillusion of community or this, this sort of um, uh, fragmentation. Um, and there are obviously harms on all aspects. First of all, physically. So obviously I'm a GP. I, um, I see a lot of chronic illness and it is astonishing that in a time when medical advancement has come so far, and people can survive more than ever from you know, diseases such as cancer and, and HIV and things that used to kill them instantly, we still have a hugely increasing rate of chronic disease. So cardiovascular disease, hypertension, stroke, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, inflammatory conditions, inflammatory bowel disease, and rheumatoid arthritis, and all of them have been implicated, one of the main factors that have been implicated is social isolation and loneliness. So much so that five years ago, Theresa May, the then prime minister, appointed the first loneliness minister in this country, that, whose sole job was to tackle loneliness. I mean, obviously, they didn't do this out of altruism and because they love us, maybe they do, I don't know, but most likely they do this because they realize the burden of disease from loneliness is massive. And it's actually probably cheaper for them to try to hit it as its source rather than try to you know, um, keep alive all of those people with chronic conditions. So even in general practice now, we have something called the social prescribers that are attached to every network of GPs. And their sole job is to try to introduce people who may be lonely, isolated, suffering from mental health problems to a, a community. And that's how fragmented the wider community has become. And we know this and we see this. We see how lonely people are. But the astonishing thing about loneliness is that we think it's like an elderly person thing where the old people are in their homes feeling lonely. But surveys show that the, increase, the biggest increase in loneliness is coming from the younger age group, 18 to 24 year olds. They are the most, they are getting to be the most lonely. And that is, that is, showing up in also the incidence of mental health illness, mental illness. So it affects our body and of course it affects our, our minds because um, it's astonishing the rise, especially of anxiety amongst young girls now. Like I'll, I'll highlight them as really the, the key. And we think we are immune, but as someone who works in the community, as someone who has a teenager, who, who, who's uh, got teen clubs that we, we run, it is astonishing the rates of teenage anxiety and depression, self-harm, et cetera, in our community. And yes, it's multifactorial. Yes, you can say there's multiple factors involved, but one of the biggest factors implicated, and there's a really good book called Lost Connections by someone called Johan Hari, one of the biggest implicating factors now in depression rise and anxiety and mental illness in general is social isolation and lack of connection and lack of community. And of course, the, the other biggest factor of this isolation, the other biggest benefit of togetherness is on our soul. Our mind, the body, our soul are intricately connected. The biggest mistake we've made in medicine and we continue to make is trying to isolate these two. You know, someone's got a heart disease, you send them to a cardiologist, someone's got mental illness, you, they see a therapist, it's all very, it's all intertwined. And, and it's so intertwined with our soul as well. If one of these things isn't right, then our soul is not at its optimal, um, it's not at its optimal peace, if you like. And if you think about it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed so many things to be done in jama'ah. Salah is one of the most personal connections with Allah, right? It's one of like, it's like you talking to Allah. This is what we tell yeah, our children. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's much more thawab in jama'ah. Now, our community is terrible at Jama'ah. I don't know, like I'm talking about the Iraqi community. 
Um, I don't know, maybe other communities that are here that are represented are better. But as a general thing, we, we, we often think, well, no, I won't concentrate. I don't trust the imam. I do, you know, lots of reasons why people don't pray jama'ah. But it is heavily, heavily um, prescribed for us in our ahadith, Sunni, Shia, whichever denomination, to pray jama'ah. So there must be a hikmah behind this communal coming together of souls, this communal worship. Hajj, even these events, these majalis, we do them in we do them in community. There is a huge effect of community on our soul as well. So, so mind, body, and soul, all of them are affected by who you are surrounded by. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I probably haven't told you anything new. Maybe you, you knew this already. So why is it that knowing this cognitively? And in theory, it hasn't translated. And why is it that I feel that maybe things are changing, but I feel that more and more our communities are becoming more fragmented? I'll give you an example of Dar al Islam Center. I could only talk about us. You know, alhamdulillah, we are seeing so many wonderful people coming back to this center. For a very, very long time, there was no one. And alhamdulillah, in Muharram, we have a really good attendance. I can see people stretching out that way um, in our in our weekly programs or in other speeches I've given, it's been a very, very, very low attendance. Now, attendance itself is not a signal of anything, but it may be a signal of general discontent or general feeling of not wanting to be part of the community. And we should really ask ourselves why. We need to introspect and ask ourselves, has this community, has our community pushed people away? So one of the factors as to why we are not in communities, obviously, is the wider world around us. There's a lot of pull towards this feeling of look after yourself, of you know, uh, your, your self-improvement. If you don't want, you, you're going to look after yourself because no one else will, dog eat dog, kind of. It's, just, it's, the, it's the atmosphere we're in. And you go out into the workplace, and literally that's, how, that's, the, that's the mantra of most workplaces, you know, um, you know survival of the fittest, literally. Um, and maybe it's a cap maybe being cynical, it's capitalism and it's conservatism, it's all these other pulls that are really outside our control. But there's a constant thing about uh, being needing to be individual to the extent to uh, the detriment of connection with other people. So obviously there are external factors, but internally as well, I would say that our community over time, maybe um, and this is, might be controversial has shown attributes that a community shouldn't have. So there's a, really, there's a really interesting distinction, if you read articles, between what is a community and what is a cult. You know what cult is, yeah? So people hear about the extreme end of cults. They hear about cults in terms of um, somewhere in America where they've all killed themselves and things like that, and terrible things have gone on. And there are cults within Islam as well. There are lots of cults within there. But if you actually look at the roots of what a cult is and what a community is, you start to maybe wonder as to whether our communities in time, in order to preserve themselves, took on slight cult-like characteristics that pushed people away. So I'll give you some examples. So for example, a community. A community encourages individual and collective consciousness. You have an individuality but you are part of a collective whole. Whereas a cult is about letting go of your individuality and merging into everyone else, whether it's what you wear, whether it's um, how you speak. You know, people, a lot of young people that are not here today, probably who've left our communities, may have come here and felt like they dressed differently or they thought differently or they acted differently and they didn't feel that like they were welcomed or they didn't feel that they were included. Uh, we talked about inclusivity yesterday. They never felt a part of the community, and slowly, slowly, they decided to step away maybe from the community, maybe from Islam altogether. And we see that a lot. Uh, a community is inclusive, so as many different people as possible, whereas a cult is quite exclusive and narrow, its definition of who's allowed to join this cult or be part of it. Um, a community attracts warmth, openness, interconnectedness. There's no pressure, there's no fear. There's a want to be part of this thing, whereas uh, in a cult, it's all secretive, it's reclusive, manipulative. There's a lot of like, if you don't do this, you'll, you'll be shunned forever. You know, maybe remnants of that in our childhood when people told us we'll go to hellfire if this was like this or this was like that, and there was a lot of fear. 
you know, when you grow up and then you don't have to fear anymore, it's like a liberation. And then you think, well, you know, Islam is fear or community is fear. I'm just going to keep to myself. Leadership is very important. Leadership has to be open and transparent. Leadership has to be elected by uh, the people, has to be representing the people. Um, whereas in a cult, a leadership is, auto, you know, is, is autocratic. It's, it, it makes people dependent on them, makes them feel that they are uh, subservient to them. There's no questioning. There's no um, uh, ability to question the leadership or the way it is. So there's, it can, I can go on. And I see a few nods and a few smiles because I think people may have experienced various elements of these things in our communities growing up and maybe still do. And therefore, maybe as a community, I would say we haven't been as good a community as we have wanted. And therefore, we have pushed people away. Maybe that's another factor as to why we are in the situation we are. More fragmented than ever. Really, everyone kind of like looking after their family and, and, and enamored in their own lives and their jobs, and, and, and that's all important. But deprioritizing the concept of community. I feel that it's changing. It's changing because people are now getting children who are getting older, and now they're saying, well, I, I think I need a community. And so I feel like there's more of a need now, and people are realizing it, but they don't know where to turn. And people are turning to go abroad, because they feel like, actually, if we go to the Middle East, we're more likely to find people that are aligned with our values. There's a huge exodus out of the UK at the moment, maybe. It feels like that, um, which is fair enough. I understand why, when the wider society has values you know, different to yours. But the single protect biggest protective factor for our children and our values remains always community. And so if it's not working, we have to think about how we can change it. So let's be really practical. Let's start with the salawat. I don't want to overrun. Um, okay, I'm okay. So I'm going to talk you through four steps that I think we can all take um, to try to improve the situation. Um, I'm always a believer, like I said, in practicality and trying to come about some kind of a change. So the first step is um, talking to strangers. So um, I, asked this I asked this question to some teenagers once. When's the last time you talked to strangers? talked to a stranger, like you voluntarily started talking to a complete stranger, and they were like, and adults, us adults will probably be even worse, you know, um, especially it, growing up in London, like, you know, if you've ever been on public transport, if you've ever walked into this, no one says hi to each other, people don't say, how are you today, or no one, no one talks to each other, and we've become very accustomed to this. And we're always a bit fearful of, like, people might think I'm strange if I try up a conversation. And then we get quite comfortable in our ability to just be by ourselves. The problem with that, obviously, apart from the fact that we never get to meet new people, is uh, there's a lot of people that come to our communities and our community centers as strangers. They come and they're, like, looking a little bit alone and they don't really know anyone. Maybe they are reverts. Maybe they are from a different community. Maybe we just haven't grown up with them. Maybe they're Iraqi that come from, God forbid, you know, Europe or something like that. And we just, we just see them as other. And we get very, very used to our own circles. And we actually think that we can't be bothered with strangers because they will probably disrupt our day. So there was a very interesting study done in America. So there was a social scientist, someone called Nicholas Epley. I think he's a behavioral scientist, University of Chicago. So he did this uh, survey on people that take public transport, the equivalent of the London Underground in, in Chicago. And he asked them beforehand, uh, a bunch of commuters randomly selected, um, what would you prefer to do? What would make you happier on this journey? To listen to your own AirPods and read your book and do your own thing or scroll on your phone or talk to a stranger? And the vast majority said, I'd prefer to, to be on my own. And I think a lot of people would say that, you know, I'm, I'm on the commute. The last thing I want to do is strike a conversation with a complete stranger. But he made people do it anyway. And at the end, he um, took a survey of how happy that journey made them feel. And to their surprise, even if they thought they wouldn't be happier, they were much happier for that little bit of interaction, no matter how superficial, with someone they had never met before. Um, and in a world where we are increasingly connected via our mobile phones to anywhere else in the world, we are more disconnected than ever. Very likely you will never talk to the person next to you unless they are your relative or your friend that you've come with or the person in front of you, the person in the back of you. Most likely you won't speak to them again. 
um, despite being in the same vicinity. And the problem with this is that if everyone does it, eventually no one gets to know anyone else, and you miss out on potentially wonderful interactions um, and potentially future friendships. This means also that we are not as integrated into the wider community maybe as we'd like to be as well on a social level. Maybe on a work level we are, it's not easy to be integrated if there are differences in values and things like that. But on a general note, that's, that, that means we are very much keep to ourselves. So number one is talk to a stranger, try it. <laughs> I did, I did similar talk last year to a group of women, and someone came up to me afterwards. She was a Reva. I, I hope she's not here. Maybe she's here. It's fine. But she said, someone tried to talk to me, and she goes, it was really awkward. And, um, but, but at least she tried. And it, she appreciated the fact that someone tried. You'll be surprised in this audience, even those who are married with children and extended family, how many people are really, truly lonely, and how many people next to you might be having a really difficult time at the moment. Um, sometimes a smile, even not even a talk, can really, really make a huge difference to, to their day and to yours. So that's number one. Number two is enhance your peripheral relationship. So there's a lot of people we know, Salam, how are you? Um, you know, I know a lot of people, Alhamdulillah, Shukur. Um, sometimes if you just take a little bit of the time to just enhance, uh, increase that relationship a little bit, literally a few seconds to ask a follow-up question, you can really get to know that person so much better. Every day I walk into to work, when I go in and I see the same, sec the same receptionist sitting, hi, how are you? I might say something like, you know, I had a really, I had a really you know, busy weekend, you know, I did this. Suddenly I've opened up a little bit to her, a little bit of myself, and then she can reciprocate in return. If we all did this a little bit in our daily lives, the people on the school run, the people at work, the people you know, that we might see in our majalis but never really fully know, then again, I think our life would be so much enhanced. And you might find that actually sitting here would be someone who can become your dearest and, and closest friend. We tend to stick in our communities to ourselves and our cliques and our people that we've grown up with and our people that we know because that makes us more comfortable and we're very good at that. And if I say to young girls, keep, keep hold of your friendships, young women, sorry, like in their 20s, um, they're very good at that. Um, but expand your friendship circles, get to know new people, maybe, you know, um, talk to someone else for a little bit. Uh, that's much harder to do for some people. But if we all did that, again, the interconnectivity would be so much more enhanced. Our lives, their lives could be so much more enhanced. Um, and, you know, when people pass away, and I just went to, uh, I went to a fatah of someone very dear uh, to the community just, just a, a few hours ago, um, and then people are like, I knew her, you know, you kind of know them, but do you really know them? Have you really asked anything about them? Do you know anything about their lives, their likes, their, their you know, their, their fears, whatever? It may be that in that very short conversation, you have somehow given them some kind of reassurance or yourself you may have guided be guided by them so enhance your peripheral relationships number three is make your current the, so choose which relationships you want to make exceptional and work on them really hard friendships and uh, even between family members doesn't come automatically just because you know the person all your life people change people grow people develop and, in, and unless you are curious enough to keep getting to know people, you will never be able to reach the level of relationship you want to, to reach. I did a, a lecture about death and regret recently. And one of the biggest regrets people have in their lives is that they didn't, their father passed away and they didn't really know him very well. Or their, you know, their, their mother, their aunt, their cousins, people who are close to them, or even their friends, they hadn't kept in touch and suddenly they've gone. You don't want to get to the point where you are regretting like this. It, it takes work to prioritize relationships. But there's a recent study that was, a recent book that was published on the longest study for happiness. And the number one factor for the quality of our lives is the quality of our relationships. So enhancing our relationships, if there's someone there that you, you are a friend of and you think that they're a really good person, I know that if I hung around them more, I would be a better person, then work on that. And also, 
I think here I put a caveat that even your person who you think is your enemy or someone who you think is opposed to you, there are, in this Muharram, maybe, I don't know how many hundreds of majalis going on. Just down the road, there's, there's like five or something. Um, a lot of people won't step foot in that mosque, won't step foot in this mosque, won't listen to that speaker, don't like that speaker. The problem is when you don't ever speak to someone face to face and really get to know them and make an effort to know them, you know, you, you other them. And when you make them an other person, it's us versus them. And it's like it enhances the, the deep, deep um, uh, fractions there are within our community. The London Shia community is massive. Imagine all of us together. Like we would, we would be huge, but we are not even like touching the surface of our potential as a community because we are still divided, not communicating, not talking, not entering other people's places, not not you know not having that open dialogue. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, لا يستوي الحسن والسيء اتبع بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه حميم ولي حميم. So you do, uh, you do, so, you do give, give something that is better, and it may be that whoever is between you and the other person, adawa, uh, enmity will be your closest friend. There's always hope. And finally, uh, so the th third one is work to improve your relationships, to make them more exceptional. And finally, um, is, is the prioritization of community work. And I can't really talk about this enough because um, in, in my capacity uh, here in Dar al-Islam in the last year as only literally, like I don't work here, I'm here as, as much as I can. So many people come up to us and say, please can you start a service for this? Please can you start a counseling service? Please can you start a support group for this? These particular subsect of people that are, work, that are carers for their elderly parents, they need something. This subsect of people with young children, they are isolated and alone. Uh, children with mental health illnesses are on waiting lists for CAMs and for uh, counseling for years. Um, please, can you start something here? And I say, I want to do all of that. We want to do all of that. But we are only, as a community, as strong as the individual members and the time we put in. And if we do not prioritize community work, then what we are doing is we are delegating it to others, hoping that others will fill in that gap. Maybe we don't like the communities that we, that we come to. With, we think that this X, Y, Z needs changing. But I just, there's a disconnect between the passionate um, opinions of people and their ability to actually act and do something about it. Community work is tiring and draining, takes time, it's volunteering, it's... Um, it's, it's difficult because our lives are so set up to work, 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 so that we earn enough for this current situation to have the lifestyles that we're having. But maybe we need to step back and, and reprioritize how we are living, the standards to which we think we are living, in order to make this time if we think we are time deficient. We can all do little bits. If we can't give our time, then we can try to give other things. Our money, our support, our attendance are, are just... Are, Verbal support, anything, is, is better than nothing. But we will only strengthen as a community through each and every single one contributing what they can, and everyone is able. I am so happy that I can see in front of me people from all cultures, because before we were always divided on cultural lines. This is becoming eroded because we have this English language as our common um, denominator. Uh, but we can unite further. The ayah that I quoted at the beginning, وَاَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا حَبْلِ اللَّهِ is the rope of Allah. Allah. This ayah says, hold on to it. The rope of Allah is, is the Qur'an, is the Ahlul Bayt, is whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as our guidance. And when it says, hold on to it together, it's like then you have to be in close proximity to hold on to some, one rope together. The imagery is quite you know, stark. Because then it says you were enemies and you were on the brink of hellfire and we saved you from it. And so it's an imagery of us holding onto a rope, looking down on hellfire. And it, we can only hold on to that rope with the cooperation of those next to us to allow us to hold on to the rope together. We hold on together. And this is what Imam Hussein did. They had a band of very few men. They had very, very few men. 
on those plains of Karbala. But we are here all these years later remembering them and not the other army that was thousands because it's not always the numerical value. We are the sum of our small parts. They bound together no matter their ethnicity, no matter their language, no matter their background, their previous sins, whatever it may have been that brought them to that place, they were together united as one. And it's only in this unity of community that we find the strength we need. Everyone is so scared now. Like you talk to parents, they are so worried. What's the future for our children? Our children are going through this and that, or we as a community are going through this and that. And I understand the fear, but the most important thing that will combat this and will allow us to um, evolve and thrive and actually integrate into the wider community around us is this togetherness, this holding on to hablillah together just as Imam Hussein and his companions and his family did. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the only person, the only being, the only way that we can unite our hearts to unite our hearts together. And to be really practical as well in how we go about trying to change the community so we can bring it closer together. وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين.